I'm just waiting notification. Okay, boom. And we are live. I want to thank everyone for tuning in to a very special edition of Off the Record on the People's Podcast this afternoon. We have a magnificent guest with us today, one who is going to give us some amazing information as well as inspiration, and that is none other than our brother, uh, the legend himself, Minister Hot. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam, brother Joshua. Yes, sir. And I wanted to, on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, I wanted to thank you for the first interview. Thank your family. I mean, the first interview was incredible. We had so many questions, so many comments. And just so, such a positive response that we had to do a part two. So thank you for blessing us with a part two, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And thank you, brother, for asking me to come back. And I pray that everything that I said before, I didn't hurt anybody's feelings. I uh, uh, hope they enjoyed what I had to say as far as the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And I pray a lot that we could say something today that help and touch someone and make them feel valuable in life. And thank you again. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Excellent. Well, uh, first of all, uh, Sister Ma'am says, I should make a family. Welcome, Salam, ma'am. And thank you, everyone who's watching all around the world. The, yes, sir. Uh, where I wanted to start back from, sir, is uh, you're joining the 5% nation and then coming into the nation. Um, let's, let's go back there, sir. Yes, sir. As I uh, said last time, uh, when Clarence 13X uh, left the temple, or uh, uh, he was uh, excommunicated, so to speak. He he came out into the street, uh, and he he was very proficient in the lessons of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. The lessons that was asked by Master Farad Muhammad, a law in person, to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And uh, the reason why uh, I've talked about what they considered the five percent nation because uh, this group is very vibrant. They're still uh, very attractive to many, many of our young people all over the country. I've been into cities, uh, Texas, I've been in Chicago, I went into Connecticut, Pennsylvania, in the South. You will find those brothers there that yes, are perfect of what they consider themselves of the 5% nation. So they um, are very, very uh, well known and a vehicle by which many of us, many of the brothers that are in the nation came through them, you know? Um, and this is why I wanted to mention them again, uh, because people need to also understand how they came into existence and also to clear up some of the misinformation, the mystique around them, uh, some lies, uh, some people adding and taking away from the group. But you know, I thought about this, Brother Joshua, and, and I thought about this before, you know, in the Quran it says, a law plan, and the devil plans, and a law plan, but a law is the best of plans. Now, if he wouldn't have been put out, maybe I wouldn't be here. If he mm. didn't bring those lessons on the street, maybe many of us would not have been here because I probably would have been in jail. <laughs> I don't mm. know where I would have been. Mm. But so there, there's, there's something that happened that made something happen. Like they, there's a there's a, a thing in the law of physics that says a body at rest tends to stay at rest until acted upon by an external or internal internal force. He was That's an right. external force that had an effect on many of us in the street. So mm. I was 14 years old, but um, it, it, it galvanized many of us because we didn't know and we didn't fully understand what these lessons meant, but we can quote them. We were able to quote them, you know? And uh, Dr. Wesley Muhammad was on a few weeks ago and he talked about the 5% nation and that, uh, that he had been a member himself and still yes, is, I think he said. But people have to understand how the 5% nation came into existence. You know, um, see, it really, we called ourselves the nation of gods and earths. There was no 5% nation. That was a... That was something that the press coined mm. the five percenters. What happened is there was groups of us, and when the when the press got a hold of all of these young people all around the city of New York uh, coming together 
and, and, and expressing the, really the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, they would say, who are you? They would say, we of the, the 5% nation, God. We are the poor righteous teachers, you know, who don't believe in the teachings of the 10%. So we are the 5% on this poor part of the planet. So this is how the, the press made us and put together that name, the five percenters. But that really wasn't the name, just like they call us the black Muslims. Yes, sir. The yes, sir. Honorable Elijah Muhammad never called us the black Muslim. We were black and Muslims. See, they wanted to put that black on there as a negative stigma on us. You understand? Yes, sir. So, and when Dr. C. Eric Lincoln wrote the book, The Black Muslims in America, that kind of stuck. So as likewise with the 5% nation, what they call them is that they didn't call themselves that the press coined that name, mm. the five percenters, because mm -hmm. they had interviewed some of those young brothers and they said that they are of the 5% nation of the gods and earth on this side of the poor part of, poor part of the planet earth. But in the lessons, the question was asked uh, to Elijah Muhammad on uh, question, lesson number two, W.D. Farad asked him, he said, who is the 5%? Not who are the 5%, who is the 5%? Hmm. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad answered, he said, we are the poor righteous teachers who do not believe in the teachings of the 10%, who are all wise and know who the true and living God is, the son of man. That's and right. then it goes on to say, otherwise known as the righteous people or civilized people. Yes, sir. Otherwise, also known as Muslims and Muslim sons. Now, it meant at that time that 5% of the population of the planet know, knew the true and living God. And 10% of them were bloodsuckers of the poor who teach the poor lies that the true and living God is a spook. And the 85% were the deaf, dumb, and blind, uh, 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 uncivilized, poison animal eaters. You understand? So it yes, broke sir. it down in that sense. So the theoretically, we're not five percenters. We were five percent of the population. Now that's this is 1930. This is 93 years later. So we must, of course, we must have grown, right? right. Yes, sir. So we might be 25 percent. We might be the 25 percenters. <laughs> so we're no longer that. But but the five percenters are now a culture. It's, a, it's an idea that has a very profound effect on young people in this country, young black men and women, okay? So I just wanted to clear that up so people can understand. So it's still a vibrant movement, very yes, much so. What they don't have is the discipline. And Clarence used to tell us all the time, we used to call him Putin or the father. We didn't call him Allah at that time. You know, mm. this is 1964 now. I'm mm. 14 years old. You know, we used to call him the father. He told us that we would eventually have to go into the mosque or into the temple. He understood that quite well, you know, but it was a very vibrant movement. And uh, we used to meet. And we used to call them universal gatherings or parliaments. We didn't call them what they call them right now. Mm. So, uh, but the, 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 Brothers of what is called the Five Percent Nation are very significant and, and very important. You know, um, you know, we tried to. Uh, there was a brother by the name of um, Oh, he's still around. By the name of Hak Islam, you might have heard of him. His name mm -hmm. was True Mathematics. Yes, sir. We, when we met in the Harlem State Office Building, he came up. He was from Queens, and he approached me. I was the captain at the time, and he said, "Brother Captain, we what we want to do." And I understand that Brother Dr. Wesley and Brother Dr. I mean Brother Wakil Allah had been trying to have a meeting with the Five Percent Nation and the Minister, Minister mm. Farrakhan, but it, it they could never put it together. But true Islam or or, or Hak Islam or yeah, Hak Islam um, approached me. We were still meeting at the time. This is around 1981. He said we want to get the minister to meet with the 5% brothers in Harlem. So mm. I said, I said, that's a grand idea, brother. I said, because we have so much in common because I've come out of it. And so uh, he made a, uh, he reached out to some of them 
but some of the old guards took a very offensive position. They said, well, we ain't not gonna have the minister teaching us and talking to us, because what, we are what? God, son, you know? And uh, so they had that position. Uh, so there was a back and forth. There was a brother named Umala and a lost self. They were the old guards from back in the 60s. So they really didn't want that meeting to take place because they felt that they didn't want Minister Farrakhan to be there sitting, sitting them down and teaching. But that wasn't the, the idea. The idea was to have a dialogue, a conversation. So it was going back and forth. And I told uh, Brother Hakislam, I said, brother, it's not time. I said, it's not time. They're not ready. And don't force them. They're not ready. And uh, so they moved on from uh, what, what I understand. I talked to Brother Wakil uh, a lot. He told me that they tried it too and it wouldn't, it, it didn't connect, mm -hmm. you know. So, but they, they are, they are a, a very significant group and hopefully one day that that will happen. I believe it will, you know, and I hope to be a part of it to bring those young brothers in. There's many of them in where, where I live and they give me the greetings of peace, God. And I, I talked to Lance and said, peace, God, what's the day's mathematics? And yes, sir. You go yes, sir. Back and forth. yes, sir. Oh, praise yes. to Allah. Beautiful. Yes, sir. And people are showing you love all around the world. And thank you very much, Minister Hawk. And uh, Sister Naima says, as like alaikum. Brother Nelson yes. Ramos uh, says, as alaikum um, from Massachusetts. Thank you all for watching. Um, Charleston Jackson says, good uh, uh, evening, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Kente on YouTube. We them boys on YouTube. Uh, Brother Musa out of New York, who, who he's familiar with you as well. Okay. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He's always in the comments and he shows love to you as well. I wanted to ask you, sir, about, okay, so you're in the nation, New York. What what was it like being uh, around Minister Akbar at that time? Was he, I think he was Brother Larry, or was he Minister Akbar? What, yes, what was sir. He like? Well, he was Minister Larry Foyex. Okay, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, he was out of Queens. And uh, he used to come into Brooklyn, you know, because we had the, the mosque in uh, Harlem was burnt down. You know, it had been firebombed. So we used to have ministers come in and the minister was there too. They were meeting up in the Bronx at a, um, at a in a building where downstairs was a nightclub and uh, the other part of the building. And we had a temple meetings up there. But Minister Akbar was, you know, he was like almost like young like us. Mm. I'm sure he's a few, uh, not too older than me, but he's a few years older than me. But he used to come in and uh, he used to teach. And we found him very, very effective because he was like, he was young, he's a young man. Mm. And um, uh, he started assisting uh, the minister because the minister had a hard time uh, making a, a, a foundation for himself as the minister in New York because Malcolm had been assassinated. And I wanted to say, when we as members of the 5%, who had been former members of the 5% came in the nation, because it was dozens of us, us, but we didn't realize, Brother Joshua, that we had uh, infused the spirit of the brothers and sisters there because they were at a low level or low level of spirit in New York City as a result of the assassination of Malcolm. And no one wanted to uh, be identified with the Nation of Islam in New York City, particularly because mm. of what happened with Malcolm. So we, not only did we give like a, a inf infusion to the, the temple, because we were coming when there was dozens of us, over a hundred. Yes, and yes, so sir. we didn't know at the time. And one of the ministers some years later told me. And also we infused those young brothers and sisters that were in the nation, that were born in the nation. To them, it, you know, the nation really wasn't, uh, it was kind of boring to them because they went out on Friday and Sunday, even though they felt a part of it, their fathers and mothers were in, but they didn't see anybody like them. So when we came in, we came with that, what we learned in the street, what we learned in the lessons, and they kind of they kind of attached to us and they loved us. And I didn't realize that at the time. So mm -hmm. we kind of made, made them feel, hey, we are young and we're in the nation. And that many of them started coming out and they weren't, they wouldn't come out with their fathers and mothers. They felt they were dragged to the mosque on, you know, on Sundays. And you were young, brother. You, you, you understand. Yes, sir. Yes, so, sir. Yes, sir. So, so when they saw us, they like, wow, man. You know, we had we still had that, you know, that kind of swagger, that kind of, 
you know, inspiration with us and we could quote the lessons. So, but, um, you know, I, I remember going out my first year in Chicago to tell you about, I met a couple of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's grandsons and I was mm. on my way to the Coliseum. Uh, this might have been 1966, 67, mm. uh, just to talk about how young people in the nation. And uh, I was speaking to one of the messengers' grandsons, I think it was Herbert Muhammad's son or, or uh, Brother uh, Nathaniel Muhammad's son. And I mm. said, Are oh, you on your way to see, see the messenger? And uh, I said, There we go. Excellent. Okay, yes, sir. So we were asking about your time uh, being under Captain Yusuf Shah. Yes, sir. Before I go to Captain Yusuf Shah, I just wanted to touch on Brother uh, Akbar, uh, formerly Brother Larry Forex, who was a Minister Farrakhan's assistant in yeah. uh, March yes, number seven. Uh, it, you know, from 1965, after the assassination of Malcolm X, 65, 66, 67, 68, the, the Muslims in New York City were struggling to retain or regain its respect by the public mm. because of what had happened with Malcolm. And uh, we had a new minister now, Minister Farrakhan. He was just from Boston. So there was that period. So, but I just wanted to give a lot of credit to Minister Akbar because he helped set up the ministry class to recruit a lot of those brothers uh, that came into the nation to go into the ministry class because there was a point where we had satellite temples from A almost to Z, you know, and they were different parts of the community. There was some on the uh, Spanish Harlem. I believe New York City was probably the first city that set up a Spanish speaking mosque. Then there was mm -hmm. some in the Caribbean community, which we call Flatbush. There was some uh, in uh, the different communities that where the Muslims wasn't able to go before. So Brother Akbar was very instrumental in, in helping set up things like that. Also, we had um, uh, the Black Family Day. There, we had 70,000 people to come out. Brother Akbar was, is a well-rounded organizer. He helped organize a lot of that. Mm. Put together the flyers, made sure all the logistics were in place. For this to happen, uh, he would also uh, work on, he was in charge of the FISH program, was able to, uh, to, this, uh, to set up all the necessary system for the FISH to be distributed. The brothers would go down to the docks and unload the FISH. He was very, very instrumental in many of those things. People just don't know. Mm -hmm. you know? And uh, that's the kind of brother he was. He was an organizer as well as a good teacher. He had an a, a, a extraordinary grasp of the history of the nation of Islam and the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know? So he was very, very good in that area. Uh, there's many other things that he did, but Captain Yusuf Shah, I've never met any man that can train men. He knew how to train men. Mm -hmm. A lot of us brothers that came into the nation didn't have fathers. We didn't have, um, you know, big brothers. And he played, he was in that role. He knew mm -hmm. everything, almost like everything that we, we thought about, he already knew. And in his FOI classes, he would, also, he would instruct us on how to handle things in our house. Mm -hmm. He would also, he said, if the, he said, brother, he said, you don't put out a brother. He said, if a brother comes in, his spirit's looking down. He said, nine out of 10, that brother don't have no money in his pocket. Mm -hmm. He said, we cannot go to a brother and literally put him out to the temple because his spirit is low. He said, find him a job. Make sure he made sure that every brothers of the FOI had a job. You couldn't be in the FOI without a job, you know? And, and, and he would, I mean, he would hold sessions. He would say, all right, who here don't have a job? <laughs> And the brothers would raise their hand and he said, all right, who has a business? And he said, here's Brother Lomas. Brother Lomas has a, a, a cab company. You need any drivers, Brother Lomas? You understand? Brother Lomas, yes, sir. We got, we got Brother, um, Brother Robert who has a paint uh, a business. You need any painters, Brother Robert? Yes, sir, I just got a contract, Brother Captain. He literally knew men. 
This is why I understand why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad kept him and appointed him. He knew men. Mm. He would never, he would, if, if their situation came up, he would say, you have to investigate. He said, you just don't arbitrarily just deal with something. He said, investigate, find out what the brothers and sisters uh, condition is. And he would always come to the aid of the brothers of the nation of Islam, whatever it may be. That's right. Yeah, he was, a, he was a no nonsense man. He knew us. I remember the first Savior's Day, I think I might have mentioned this, that I went to Chicago and I, I came home. I was, you know, I wasn't driving at the time. I was taking public transportation and I got the corner of my block. He came around in a Cadillac and came around the corner and rolled down his window and said, Salam alaikum, my brother. He said, do you enjoy Savior's Day? Did you see your leading teacher? I said, yes, sir. I thought he was spying on me, but Joshua, you know, I'm got this. But what he was doing, he was like a, a shepherd. He was making sure that the young brothers were fine. Um, you know, there was a point in time where we were, uh, were asked to increase our sales of Muhammad Speaks because a lot of brothers, the messenger, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad never wanted to force us to sell the papers. That never was his idea. Mm. Of course, we had some strong, diligent, forceful captains, and they wanted to prove to the messenger that we could take more than we could handle. And uh, we were only getting 25 cents on the paper at the time. So this is 68, 67. And it came to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's attention that a lot of brothers were stacking the papers and sisters mm. were calling the messenger calling Chicago, telling my, my, my husband is not selling the papers, he's buying them and uh, uh, he's using the money from some of the personal, our personal accounts for our children may not, because the brothers were buying papers. So the captain called the general FOI meeting. He called the general, all the FOI came in. Some brothers came from Connecticut, some came from the outskirts of New York and the this particular FOI class was a Saturday morning and Captain Yusuf Shah was sitting behind a table. Uh, the minister was there and the secretary because it had come to the message attention that a lot of brothers was leaving the temple because they couldn't uh, sell the papers. So Captain Shah was sitting behind the, boat, behind the table and all the brothers were lined up in columns and each one would come up, salute, and they would ask, uh, um, he said, brother, how many um, papers uh, do you sell, brother? He said, brother, captain, I sell in uh, 200. He said, are you buying them or are you selling them? <laughs> so the brother said, uh, brother, captain, maybe I might sell about 25 or 100 or 50. He said, brother, you can't do that. And then, uh, and then I, I remember I came up. And I'm, I'm still in my teens now. And I came up and, uh, and Minister Farrakhan asked me, he said, uh, brother, uh, how, how many papers are you selling? Uh, I said, I don't remember what I said. So, but brother captain interrupted Minister Farrakhan and said, brother captain, he's a good soldier. He could, brother, this brother can sell papers. Of course I could, you know, but they weren't interested in that. So what they did was they asked each brother, now Captain Shaw kind of organized this here. And with the minister's help, he said, what we'll do, he said, brother, are you, how many could, how many, how many papers do you know that you could sell? The brother said, I know I can sell a hundred. He said, well, you don't, you don't, you, you don't take 200 brothers. If you could sell a hundred, then that's what you take. Mm. Then another brother came up. He said, brother, how many are you selling? Oh, 25. Brother Captain, he said 25. He said, how many papers could you sell? He said, I can sell at least 200 or 350. He said, well, you can up your, so you see what he did, Brother Joshua? The brothers yes, that couldn't sell, he lowered theirs, and the brothers that were taking less papers who could sell more, it, they increased their numbers. So it kind of balanced out everything. That's what kind of man he was. And, and that's what he wanted to show the messenger that he wouldn't force the brothers to sell the papers. But uh, he was well known in New York City. 
and well respected among the men. You know, yes, Praise sir. Jesus, right. Yes, sir. Beautiful. Yes. And people are showing you love all across the world. Sister yes. Lane and Sister Miriam and Sister Anita and Brother Kennard and Lost Number 74. Welcome to my family. And thank you always for showing love as well. I wanted to ask you, you said the secretary. Um, this is Brother John Ali, the secretary. No, uh, Brother Maceo Haziz. Maceo Haziz. Yeah, he yes, was sir. the secretary uh, for New York City. Uh, we didn't have that much contact with him. You know, the word secretary comes from the word secret. So you didn't yes, know sir. so much about him, but he he was um, very instrumental in restoring and uh, uh, along with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and Minister Farrakhan uh, opening up mosque number seven. Uh, we had a brand new building in 1970. You know, we, we, you know, we didn't have a school. We only had a school on Saturday. We didn't have a University of Islam the University of Islam didn't open up until 1970, mm. you know. But prior to that, the, the the brothers and sisters, the children used to go to school on Saturday, because uh, we didn't have uh, teachers and in a established school at that time, and uh, they were they were in the regular public school. But on Saturday, they would go and kind of filter out all that madness that they were receiving during the week from the uh, the, the white man school. But in 1970, that's when it opened up. And Brother Maceo Aziz was very important, very instrumental, I should say, in, in organizing and getting the necessary uh, money and the loans and the, to, to help open up the, the whole building. We had a mosque, uh, a school, and businesses on the bottom, uh, Temple Number no. 7 or Mosque Number no. 7, New York City. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And I wanted months. to talk about the MGT. Yes, sir. Uh, you know, our MGT, you know, they don't get the credit outside the nation, you know, because people think, I heard one sister just say recently, which is misinformation. The reason why I didn't join the nation because the sisters walk behind the brothers. That's that's an old misinformed idea. Mm, mm. We don't, it's not in the nation. The sisters, the MGT were are some of the most important people in the nation. Yes, they don't get outside. You know, we hear about uh, Fannie Lou Hamer. We hear about Sojourner Truth. We hear about uh, Ida B. Wells and uh, all those great, you know, uh, uh, Harriet Tubman. But we don't hear about the MGT. These sisters were bad. I mean, I remember when we we had the first, uh, uh, we were trying to buy the temple number two at the time that's now Moss Marion. Yes, and we put a million dollar drive. New York City was going to bring in a million dollars. Mm. And I remember they called a general meeting. They called a, 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 a unity meeting between the FOI and the MGT. And Captain Shaw got up there and said, we're going to get this, you know, because that's the way we talk. We're going to get this temple for the messenger for Mr. Muhammad. There was no doubt. There was no explanation. There was no, you know, reasoning why or what. That was our task. And he got up, he said, brothers, we're going to have to raise uh, so-and-so amount of money. And Sister Captain uh, Amina, her name was Sister Cla Captain Clotel at the time. She mm. said, uh, and, and Brother Minister Farrakhan was standing up there on the rostrum and along with Captain. And she stood up and she said, uh, uh, Brother Minister, uh, the sisters, we already got $50,000. $50, <laughs> mm. Brother, they were way ahead of us. Mm. way ahead of us. And I remember the captain used to say, he used to say, brothers, he said, you don't know what's going on in the sisters' class. He said, but they know what's going on in your class because you're telling them everything. <laughs> and their class, anything that we had to do in Moss number seven, the sisters are what, way ahead of us and were two steps, four steps and five steps ahead of us on putting together. Any program, uh, any implementation of any, they sold more tickets than us when mm. we had an event. They sold, except, you know, because we didn't allow the system to sell Muhammad Speaks on the street. That was a no-no. But anything else, they were far ahead of us. So the sisters in the MGT are some of the most organized, well-rounded, and everything they did was precise. And it was mm. for the help building of the nation of Islam. This is true. I just wanted to give those sisters some shout outs and props. That's right. 
Oh, praise the to Allah. Yes, sir. And we and we yeah. need more, we need more brothers to uplift the MGT as well. Um, That's right. Because the language. message is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, "All my followers are ministers, even That's right. That's right. Beautiful. And Sister Naeem Abdullah says, that's right, teach. And thank you, everyone, who is showing love all around the world. I wanted to ask you about um, being, seeing the minister prior to 75. So let's say 1974, going into 1975, and you're a young man, and you see him. Did you have, um, did you think that he was, as the most humble Elijah Muhammad was getting older? Did you think that the minister was, in fact, Wherever he says go, go. Did you have that contact? Did you think the minister was going to be the one, or did that not come out until later? Oh, that that for me it didn't come out till later. But of course, I saw all of his qualities. I saw the significance okay. of what he was doing and what he was saying to me because he was so close to us. Of course, there were those that were attacking him outside the the mosque and inside because the, you you see in New York City you have such a a, a pluralis. Not, not a paralysis, but a population of different groups. You have the Black Nationalists, you have the Black Hebrew Israelites, you have the Black Church, you have uh, the Black Panthers. So all of them, the minister had to deal with all of them. You know, uh, I, I just wanted to say this here about Brother uh, Minister Akbar, that he also organized for the minister to go to many of the colleges because when he first came to New York, we didn't venture outside uh, the uh, mosque or the temple because the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had instructed his ministers uh, stay in the temple, teach them, get the people to come into the temple. You have a uh, you have what is called a captured audience, and mm -hmm. you teach the people. When you go outside, you 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 um you're 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 vulnerable, you know. So there were some points that the minister didn't go out. So when Akbar became his assistant, they started getting college um, uh, events, uh, going to colleges and speaking events for him in the different colleges and university. But we, we always saw him as the, the, the messenger's representative. And if he didn't say it, we felt that, you know, then it wasn't true because it was coming from his representative, the Honorable mm -hmm. uh, Elijah Muhammad, and Minister Farrakhan. And every time he would come back from Chicago, he would come back and we would all meet and he would give us word for word what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's instructions. And he told us, I will 100% keep this instruction and I want you to help me to help him. You know, so we, 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 um, we felt him. We felt him at that time. We didn't know what was going to happen, but we knew that he played a very significant role, uh, which eventually showed today, you know, mm. yeah. Yes, sir, yes, sir. Okay, and Minister Hawk, I wanted to go back to, on part one, everybody make sure you go back and watch part one of people's podcast of Minister Hawk, the, you securing the most honorable Elijah Muhammad, and that that context of, you know, you holding post as an FOI, what that meant for you as a young man, uh, what did that mean to you, you know, being, you know, young and being able to do so? Yeah. Uh, among all the FOI in New York City, I, I believe it was throughout the nation, uh, the most important uh, going to Savior's Day for any FOI was the whole front roster. That was like, because if, if, if a captain allowed you to hold, you would have to have been selling a certain amount of papers. You had to have been paying your charity. You had to have been coming out on a constant basis because they just didn't put anybody up there because there was a trust factor, a trust factor there. So, so being a young man, there's always been my desire. I used to see all the brothers in the different cities in Newark and Connecticut and Chicago sitting front rostering. So that, that had always been as it is with all the FOI to take that position. And uh, as a young man, that was something that I always desired. I want to come home and tell my children, I told them that I stood for this man. And uh, so that was very important for me. And it, it, it allowed me to, it kind of energized me because I felt that I had the opportunity to protect the man that I love that met God in person, you know, yes. Yes, yeah. sir. Okay, well, let's speak, let's speak in a point number 12 and meeting God in person. How important is that for the younger generations uh, to understand that Master Farah Muhammad came, you know, for us? How important is that for us to, to understand that? Uh, 
um, because we, you know, this is a Christian, Judeo-Christian society. So one of the main uh, things that, uh, that Master Farah Muhammad came to do was number one, well, there's many things, but one of the main things was to destroy the spook civilization and to uh, identify who the real devil was, you know? Mm, mm, mm. So, uh, so you have this Judeo-Christian society believe that God cannot be a man, that, that he functions outside of the human factor. So uh, young brothers and sisters who, who are still under this impression that God is some spook, some spirit that's outside of the human being that doesn't function in us, it was very important for us for us to uh, uh, share that with our brothers and sisters. So us learning that God is us, that Allah came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, that very word tells us that God is not some spook, some spirit, but is real, that's lying, that's in us, that's around us. And this is what all the ministers uh, would teach all the time. Uh, that Allah appeared in the person of Master Farah Muhammad, not as a spook. So that being said, it gives us a reality and shows us that we have to work, we have to be diligent and not wait for some spirit or some spook to come out of nowhere. So uh, of course we had a hard time explaining because we didn't really have a lot of pictures to show people of Master Farah Muhammad that that kind of came many, many years later. Uh, I didn't see a, a picture of Master Farad Muhammad until maybe about, I was in the nation about four years when the messenger put up a, had a newspaper. Uh, uh, when they, when the Hearst, uh, the Hearst uh, publication in the uh, empire said mm -hmm. that W.D. Farad was a crook, he was a criminal. So the Honorable Elijah Muhammad put the Master Farad Muhammad picture on the front of the Muhammad Speak newspaper. He said, if you say this man that taught me, he said, prove it. And I will give you uh, what $10,000 from my brother's vest pocket. He said, could the man that you say, this Wallace dog speak 16 language mm -hmm. and write 10 of them, I mean, and write 10 of them and speak 16 language fluently. Is this man the one that you say that taught me? Could he uh, talk about the civilizations of thousands of years? So. That was very important, you know, very important for us. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And know that he uh, revealed to the world that God is a man. So it's important that our brothers and sisters understand that and not look for some spook or some spirit, someone outside of ourselves. Yes. Well, wow, wow. beautiful. Yes, sir. Beautiful teaching. And okay, I wanted to ask you um, the Janaza of Minister Jabril about two weeks ago now. And the minute it you know it stuck out in my mind when minister was speaking about him being a captain, then going into the ministry, and it all so of course I think about the, all of the captains who did the same thing, Minister Rock, my the minister, my father, but now you, you know, go, being from Captain Gaddafi going into now be, then being Minister Hot, what is it about the the military, the brothers who go to captains that eventually go into the ministry? What is how has that been for you personally, your journey? I think being a captain or a lieutenant, see the captain and the lieutenant in the mosque of the temple is really the hands-on person. You're in constant contact with the men. You know their families, you know their weaknesses, you know their aspirations, they share things with you. You're constantly working with them on a day-to-day -day basis. So it gives you an, an, a fundamental understanding how people think, how people function. And, you, and, and, and your job is to make sure the men are trained, you know, and that taught properly on what the mission is of the nation of Islam. So they give you like a, a basic, fundamental, rounded uh, idea on what is expected from a believer. So when you become, so that when you graduate and become a minister, you have all of those things in your pocket or in your, in your treasure chest. <laughs> and, and once you get into the spiritual, you can relate everything that you have learned, everything that you were taught and been trained as a captain or lieutenant, you can teach as a minister. You know, mm. it's, 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 very, it's, it's very fundamental, very simple, really. But it gives you that, that boost, that extra energy 
or that extra force that you need to be a minister. And and uh, the Honorable Minister Farcon, he was a lieutenant. He was a captain. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, uh, captain Joseph, he I don't think he was ever a captain, but he could teach. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, he was never a minister, but he was a captain for many, many. He just knew men, you know. And uh, your dad, uh, many of the brothers, many of the brothers that were captains, uh, you know, Brother Kareem, Brother yes, Kareem sir. Muhammad, Brother Former Linwood. I was I was his assistant for mm -hmm. from nineteen. Uh, 78 up until 1985 and, and beyond. And he, he was a, really a military man. He didn't particularly like teaching, but it gave him, because of the nature of, of the job as a captain, it gives you that, like a, that upper hand to teach, you know. It's a yes, sir. Okay. Yes, I, sir. I know you were his assistant for so long. Oh, um, yes, he, he's mentioned by so many people not just on the East Coast, but primarily on the East Coast, but about him helping to protect, uh, give us the respect in the rebuilding uh, years, as well as uh, train so many people. Uh, what, what, what was it like working with him, sir? Man, he came, uh, we were meeting in the Harlem State Office building. This is 1979. Of course, at that time, uh, the minister had a lot of opposition. He was in the process of rebuilding, you know. And um, so New York City really wouldn't, didn't really want to accept him because you still had uh, the followers of Imam Wawaz Dean Muhammad at 116th Street. And we were trying to get a foothold in New York City. And we, we were meeting at the Harlem State Office building. So one particular afternoon, because Brother Akbar would come in every other week, but sometimes he was traveling all over. So we really didn't have a permanent minister. Uh, mm. Minister Burke was helping out. So next thing I know, Brother Linwood X from Plainfield, New Jersey shows up with about, maybe about 15 men from Newark, some from Patterson, New Jersey, from, from different parts of New Jersey. And he pulls me aside, he said, uh, he introduced himself. He had a really stern, really serious uh, position in his face. <laughs> and I said, who is this brother? I'd seen him before. And he said, I'm Brother Lindwad. And uh, the minister asked me to come up here and help. And he asked me to give him a breakdown of who was there and what was what. And I found out later the re reason why the minister had him there, because the minister wanted someone that didn't have any ties to New York. Mm -hmm. Because the, uh, the the what they were trying to his opposition in New York was really strong, so he needed someone that was non-attached, you know, with anything. And he was coming. He said, "Brother Hawk," he said, "I'm here for one thing, and that is to help the minister deliver our people to the honor of Elijah Muhammad." And he really was really strong. He was he had he had some real tough kind of position that he took. And he was a no-nonsense man, but he had a heart. He had a really good heart of gold. You know, that's why, you know, the word Kareem means kind. He yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir, but, yes, but, sir. <laughs> and generous. And he was that kind of man. But uh, he was fearless. I don't know if you ever saw a picture. There's a picture in the autobiography of Malcolm X, uh, the ones that have photos. Uh, there's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad shaking hands with the people coming through the line. You see a brothers uh, with a, a, a chain link of their arms chain linked together. You know, mm. uh, I said, brother, uh, and I saw Brother Kareem. He was in the picture. I said, how did that happen? He said, brother, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, after this particular Save His Day, he said he was on the rostrum and he instant, instantaneously jumped off the, the stage and jumped down and started shaking hands with the guests. And he mm -hmm. said that took them by surprise. So he said that he told the brothers, lock, lock arms. He said, lock arms. And they locked arms. If you ever get a chance to see that picture, very striking. And he's mm -hmm. in the picture. He said, brother, I told the brothers that day to lock arms. Mm -hmm. So, but I, I believe he came, I think he told me he came in the nation around 1959, 1958, 59, very strong, very, uh, 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 no nonsense, brother. As I said, and uh, and his job was to really 
to defend the minister against any opposition. And he did that. And sometimes, you know, got him in trouble. It got him in trouble because he didn't want to listen to nobody else but the mm -hmm. minister, you know, and a great, great, great helper. And uh, the first, one of the first meetings we had was in Plainfield, New Jersey. And the, the minister said that he said, when he rode into Plainfield, New Jersey, I think this was 19, maybe 79, mm -hmm. close to 80. He said, when he saw all those clean brothers in bow ties and suits, he said, yeah, I can rebuild this thing. Because when you, you know, when you're working, you got to, sometimes you get a little apprehension. And he said, but when he saw these men in Plainfield, New Jersey, and they were all like Brother Kareem, because he had trained them. And uh, he said, yeah, we can do this. We can rebuild this. And yes, sir. All praise is due to a lot. Okay, yeah. great. And all right, Brother Minister, thank you everyone who's watching. Sister uh, Naima Abdullah Muhammad says, uh, thank you for man for your comments about the growth and her parents. And she said, you're, you're, you're helping to fill the gap between uh, the father 75, praise me to Allah. Um, so Naima says, uh, the other sister Naima says teach. So we got two sister Naima's. Thank you very much. Can't wait to post this on YouTube. We have a quick 60 second commercial uh, for all of the sponsors of the People's Podcast. And we're coming right back with you all. If you would like to um, be a sponsor, and or donor, please cash at the People's Podcast. We're grateful for every like, share, and subscriber. One moment. And we're coming right back to Minister Hyde. He does television and film editing. Please reach out to him if you need any of those services. Sister Miriam's ABC I Love Me children's book and coloring book, and now Spanish book, all three available on Amazon.com. Sister Naima's Stay On Point Dance Academy, LLC. She teaches ballet virtually to young girls all across the country, right here in the studios of Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Kenneth's bow tie maker extraordinaire. He'll ship you bow ties anywhere across the nation. Dr. Henry Carter's King Henry Turkey Legs, right here in Atlanta, Georgia. Brother Rashad Muhammad's COVID-19 Disinfected Cleaning Services out of Chicago. Student Minister Sharif Muhammad's book, A Soldier in the Movement of Christ, available on adulsharif.com. And lastly, Brother Joshua Muhammad's book, Cleopatra, as well as No Father, No Excuse, both available on Amazon. Perfect, one second. And we also have Sister Sherry, with Asiatic Minds, um, you can enroll your young child. She teaches STEM virtually to young kings and queens all across the, the globe. Sister Sherry Muhammad, Asiatic Minds, please enroll your child at AsiaticMinds.com. All right. As well as Minister Hawks, uh, amazing wife. Uh, Sister Helen, exclusively for you, Black man. This is a the Black Man Sacred Book. It is a book of poetry and or spoken word. If you would like to get a copy. Please reach out to H R S P A T R O L 42 at gmail.com. Yes, sir. I wanted to ask you. Go ahead. Yes, sir. Would you ever write a book about your life, sir? What, what, you, what you don't know, what you have done to me, uh, Brother Joshua, you have, you know, I've been writing, uh, putting uh, notes and uh, uh, information together. And uh, I've been asked this and encouraged so many times by brothers and sisters around the nation that I should do that. And I've been putting it off and procrastinating. And by coming on here, you have inspired me because it, it takes inspiration sometimes because you put things aside, you know, and I have uh, uh, decided and I've been putting things together and I will do that, sir. I'm in the process of doing that now. But I wanted to make two points before I forget because I, I, this is it's something passionate. Uh, that I have about this, these two particular subjects. One, yes, is how to eat the, one is how to eat to live. Um, I'm really, sometimes I'm really sad because we're losing some of the believers, you know, and the messengers uh, dietary program and how to eat to live is very important. Yes, sir, you know, yes, when sir. I came in the nation, I went, I think the, I, I, only, I only remember two funerals that I went to. Uh, both of them were Accidents, brothers died by accidents. And I didn't believe that Muslim died. 
Mm. You know, I didn't believe that we died because we never had funerals. We never had funerals. Now I hear brothers and sisters dying from diabetes. I, I did two genazes myself of brothers that mm. were in the nation here in New York City. And I can see also our people, our people are dying because of their, they're not eating right. Yes, they're, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, their bodies are being broken down. That's right. You know? And uh, I see, you know, some of the believers, I, I, I don't like seeing that because the how to eat to live is just fundamental. It's basic, you know, uh, and, and, and we have to take care of ourselves. This is what we, we don't believe in heaven after we die. This is this is our temple. This is what we have in the the, the how to eat to live or basic fundamental way of preserving our life. You know, Brother Joshua, I'm 73 years old. I, 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 you know, I, I've been this size almost over 40 years. Mm -hmm. I don't, you know, I, I don't adhere to the, uh, the dietary laws of the how to eat to live or dietary teachings 100%. But if you just do a certain percentage, you will literally see results. That's you know, right. I have, I have, when well, I used to be a director of a, of a community center, where I live. And I had children in my community center that was like eight years old, seven years old. This is over 30, 30 uh, 35 years ago. I see them now. You know what they see me? They said, yeah, they call me Brother Ron. They said, Brother Ron, do you ever grow old, brother? <laughs> they said, they said, brother, did you make a pact with the devil in exchange for long life? You know, they had a movie called uh, The Portrait of Dorian Gray. He made mm -hmm. a deal with the devil for longevity, for long life. Mm. I said, no, I said, I didn't make no deal with the devil. I made a deal with God that I would try to eat as best I can. I eat a lot. My wife cooks me a lot of home cooked meals and I cook now. But I also, you know, I have a little, you know, I like cookies and cakes and <laughs> pies. That's my weakness. Yes, sir, you, yes, sir. Somebody said, brother, you can get brother Minister Hawk to do anything if you give him some oatmeal cookies or some bean pies, some carrot cakes. <laughs> <laughs> but but I'm really concerned, Brother Joshua, with the health of the believers in particular and our people in general, because, you know, when I came in, they, they used to have bear witness night. And I remember there was two brothers that got up, one brother named Brother Willie Adex, and he was telling us that he had diabetes. He said that he wrote the Honorable Elijah Muhammad because they wanted to give him insulin and they wanted to put him on all kind of medication. So he said, he wrote the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wrote him back and gave him a dietary plan. And he said, once he did that plan, he went back to the doctor and the doctor told him, he said, sir, he said, your diabetes has literally been wiped out of your system. Mm. And that is one of the only diseases that you can eliminate diabetes from your system. That's mm. right. And I'm really concerned with that. Also, when I was a parole officer, I used to have to tell, take urine. And the brothers would come in and they would look at me. He said, you NOI, ain't you? You know, that's the term that they use. He said, you NOI. I said, how you know? He said, I can tell the way you look. Mm. He said, they, and I would take their urine, Brother Joshua. These were young men, 30 years old, 25, no more than 40. They're, because, you know, we, we had to make sure they weren't using heroin or cocaine. And I would test their urine and their urine would be dark as Coca-Cola and Pepsi-Cola. That's your kidneys. Their kidneys are in inundated with all kind of uh, uh, foreign uh, uh, liquids. I said, do y'all drink water? They said, no, we don't like water. But, you know, we have to do better, you know. And, our, you teach and, and, the, and the other thing I wanted to say is our children, you know, uh, we need to regain and retain our children, you know, because many of them come into the nation, and and I was taught, I was telling Captain uh, Sister Supreme Captain Aziz when I saw him in New York City, I said we're losing more of our children than we're retaining, you know, and we have to have a once they get to the age of of purity puberty. You know, in, in, the, um, in the Jewish community, you know, once they, they have a bar mitzvah, when the children are 12 years old, they're considered coming into manhood yes, because sir. they 
uh, at a certain age of their puberty and they guide them and they have like a rights of passage for them and they go into law, they may go into business. So in the black community, we need a rights of passage. And in the nation, we are losing more than we're retaining. You know, where are all these brothers and sisters that came up with me? Where's the one that came up after that? Where's the ones that came up with you, Brother Joshua? You yes, know, sir. see, the world has a, 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 an attraction to our brothers and sisters. It's called gravity. Gravity comes from the word grave and it's constantly pulling at them. So the, the, the world that they're looking at is flashy, it's, pers it's fair seeming, it's beautiful, it's attractive, but the final end is death. And you mm. know what? My daughter, my daughter grew up in the nation. Her name was Karima. That was my first child. She went to the University of Islam. She graduated. I had two other daughters. When the University of Islam closed, when the imam came in, I put them in for a while. We, my wife homeschooled them, but then we had to go to work. They went to the public school, Brother Joshua. They had to be, they knew so much. They had to be skipped mm. to the higher grades. And one of my daughters came home crying one day. She said, Daddy, the teacher said I was cheating. I said, what did you get? She said, I got a 99. And uh, that wasn't good. That wasn't good enough for her. And she said that um, uh, the teacher accused of a cheater. I had to go there and address that because they were so advanced. So my oldest daughter, when crack cocaine hit, she became a victim. This is 1987 now. She was born in the nation, went to the university. She had about three or four, she had four children at the time. And um, one day I got a call that my daughter was dead. And I had to go to her house. And I, I had put her in every drug prevention program they had in New York City. And she said, Daddy, she said, I'm, I will always be proud of you. She said, you never made me um, shame at all. She said, people in the community respect you. She said, don't give up on me. I said, I will never give, on, give up on you, Karima, but don't give up on yourself. And I did all I could you know, to keep her away from that. In fact, the way I found out is a big drug dealer, big drug dealer called me and said, Brother Ron, they called me Brother Ron. He said, I respect you and love you, brother. He said, I'm also scared of you. He said, your daughter is using crack. And she cursed me out because I wouldn't give her any more drugs because I respect you. That's how I found out. But I lost her. And we have to learn uh, and find a way to uh, uh, retain our children so when they grow up and become adults, and see in the FOI class and the young adult class, uh, under uh, I was in the class I was telling the brothers last time I spoke and the sisters that I was in a class called the young adult class and Minister Farrakhan was our instructor. And yes, our, that's right. And he taught, we talked about everything. We talked about marriage. We talked about masturbation. We talked about uh, premarital sex. We talked about drugs anything that would affect us as young people who were in the nation so we can remain in the nation was talked about. So that those are the two things I wanted to, you know, mention. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Beautiful, man. Well, I'll be pleased with your mm -hmm. daughter. So, yes, sir. so many of us uh, are dealing with that in some form of addiction. Uh, yeah. We call them nation babies now. People like myself who grew up in the nation, born in the nation, and it's yes, affecting us, like you said, it's taking out a whole lot of us. So I thank a lot for um for you addressing that. Uh, yes, sir. You did, sir. And um brother Rashad, uh, the minister's e team out of Chicago told me after he saw the, your first interview that he said the minister's uh chefs at the Celestine was in that class that you were, were talking about with the minister was teaching to oh, you. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. She was in that class as well. Yes, um sir. sister Naima says that's correct, sir. The teachers uh, singular was that wow we lost so many pioneers boom boom is breaking her heart. Um, she bears witness you're speaking the truth. Excellent. Uh, the imam, when how long did you go 
Um, were you in the other community or? Yes, sir. 75 happened. How long, how long, how yes, long, sir. how long were yeah. you a part of the other community? Uh, uh, once the imam became uh, the leader and we respected that because, you know, my belief is that um, even though he might have came in with some alternative agendas in order to take the nation in another direction, I believe there was a point when he made that major speech on Savior Day 1975, a law had intervened because people were predicting a bloodbath that once the messenger was gone, that there would be an infighting for power. But Praises be to Allah, the nation stayed intact. There was a smooth transition, regardless of what people felt, because it saved a lot of people, even though it did scatter many, many brothers and sisters. But I had, I was under the impression that, as many of us were, that uh, the imam or Minister Wallace D. Muhammad, because I had heard as a younger man that he was favored and the messenger wanted him to help him. So when he came in, we felt that was a fulfillment of that. And I, uh, I stayed from 1975. Um, and I started uh, to um, learn Arabic. Uh, I started going to the masjids. Uh, of course, we still had uh, temples and, and mosques in New York City as he was moving uh, minister. When he moved the minister out of New York, I mean, that really hurt many of us because we didn't expect that, you know. Um, uh, I made attempts to learn everything I could about Orthodox Islam. Uh, like I said, I, I, I went to Arabic classes. I began to study Quran and read it in Arabic because that's the way they teach you. When you study Arabic, you begin to read it first and you learn the alphabet and then you learn the colloquial bit, the colloquial or the classical Arabic, you know. So. Uh, but there were signs I was seeing. And like I said before, uh, he called a major meeting one time. And, um, and I, I was trying to defend him at one time until I realized that, you know, he was taking the nation in another direction. But he called a major meeting. It was in 1978. And that's when he announced that uh, he said that Minister Farrakhan, we thought we didn't know what the meeting was about, but it was he was on a hookup, a national hookup via phone. And he said that Minister Farrakhan, he said his uncle John Muhammad, the messenger's brother, he said uh, Abdel Aziz, which is Minister Akbar, he said that John uh, Muhammad from out of San Francisco, he said Muhammad Ali. And he said, uh, Jeremiah Shabazz were all um, trying to set up an opposition against him, setting up, trying to bring back the old teachings of Elijah Muhammad. He called it in the Elijah Muhammad Educational Foundation, which all of that was untrue. Mm. Uh, but he was getting information from different people. That's what he was getting. And I said to myself, I said, oh, man, I said, what's going on here? I said, I have to find if this is true. I said, I'll, and I started asking people, where is the minister? You don't have a contact with him? No one knew, you know? But in, prior to that, I made all kinds of attempts to stay with him because I felt that he was a follower of the Holy Elijah Muhammad like us and was taking us to the next level. But I saw the next level and was being uh, neg negatively affecting many of the leaders. Some of them started going back to the street. Some of them went into full-fledged Orthodox Islam. Some of them went to Hinduism and, and oh, I mean, some of them went back to the grave. You know, a lot of us weren't rooted, rooted in the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. I, I may have been, maybe that's what brought me back, but I began to uh, become very disenchanted with what he was saying and what made me realize that he wasn't with the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We were at a place at Madison Square Garden, but it wasn't the, the, the large venue, it was called uh, Felt Forum. And he was there teaching. And he said that, he said, I'm getting word that some of y'all saying I'm not following my father. 
He said, but let me make it clear today. He said, all of you that's following Elijah Muhammad, you can leave. But all of you that are following Imam W.D. Muhammad, you could stay. And that was my exit because I thought we were all followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And um, so, but I made I made all kinds of attempts. Uh, and you know what? The 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 author of our community were very um, they were very disrespectful to us because we were trying to come into their masjids and try to have a coalition with them. And they were very adamant and they were very disrespectful to us. I remember being at one of the masjids in, in, in Brooklyn and you know we were doing, uh, the, uh, we were at the Juma, Juma prayer. And you know, after Juma prayer, you, uh, the brothers make a particular prayer and then you, you, you have another prayer to, to get extra blessings. And uh, you, you make that separately. It's a dua prayer. And one of the Arab Muslims saw me sitting and because we weren't used to sitting and I wasn't correctly sitting and he came up to me. He said, brother, you will not get the blessings if you're not, your foot is not right. You're, you're not sitting correctly. You know, what, what something rose up in me. That FOI came up. I said, yo, let me tell you something, my man. <laughs> I said, the FOI came out of me. I said, listen, I said, Allah's not interested in how I'm sitting. He wants to know what's in my heart. Wow, wow, if I'm a true believer, am I believe in the truth of what is revealed to me through Prophet Muhammad, may peace be upon him, and the scriptures. And he stepped away, he said, yo, this, this cat is serious. <laughs> I didn't like that, but I know it was contempt. That's all it was. They knew what we were coming in. So, you know, but uh, all praises due to Allah. The minister stood up and I found him. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Beautiful. So you gotta be rooted. You gotta be rooted. See, when you're rooted in the teachings, you know, I remember reading a book called Man, Child in the Promised Land mm. by Claude Brown. In that book, he said that he had noticed that many of the brothers, because at that time, I guess that was when Malcolm was teaching, he said, because he grew, he was born and raised in Harlem. He said he noticed all the brothers were joining the nation of Islam, all of his friends who had been, you know, street hustlers and gangsters and whatnot. He said they were joining the nation. He said he went, he had went to jail and came back, and some of them had started dropping out. But he said he noticed, even though they dropped out. He said they might have went back to hustling, they might have went back to shooting drugs, they might have went back to chasing women, and they might have went back to you know doing those kind of things. He said, but I noticed they never went back to the church mm. because once you get the teachings, you can't go back to a mystery God. So mm. if you're rooted in the teachings, I don't care where you go, once the teachings of Islam is with you under the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, I don't care where you go, you can't shake it, man. It's like road spray. It's on you. <laughs> so you have to be rooted. This is why in the Holy Quran, it talked about the narrative about um, uh, the prophet like Moses. Mm -hmm. And it says in, the, in, in that chapter, I'm trying, it's the 28th surah of the Holy Quran. It, it, it's, it, Allah is talking to Prophet Muhammad. He had to be talking to him because that was what re, was revealed to him. It says, it said, you were not on that side, on the western side of the mountain when we revealed, when we revealed to you the revelations, okay? To warn the people who no warner has come before. It's mm -hmm. telling Prophet Muhammad, no, you were not going to be on that western side of the mountain when we revealed the word to a people who no warner has come before. It says it's a prophet like Moses. That was the honor Elijah Muhammad. See, he was telling them to the western side of the mountain is the western hemisphere. Yes, sir. And the mountain represents a government, okay? And the warning to a people who had never had a warner 
is the black man and woman of America. We have never had a woman. So once you are rooted in that and you believe in that, see that was, uh, people talk about Malcolm, once he, yeah, there was opposition, but once you stop believing in the man that you said that met God, once that connection is gone, then you feel that the man that, uh, that you say you believed in is no longer true and right. And that's what happened when Wallace Muhammad came in. He took our very belief and faith in the man that we say that we believed in. Yes, this is true. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Ex excellent teacher, Mr. How can people show you love all around the world? Minister Aisha out of Phoenix says, teach the history. Sister Naima says, teach. Sister Naima says, yes, sir. My brother Quincy Muhammad uh, says, you know, showing you love with the heart emoji. Teach, sir. Allah Wakba, we thank you. And um, many for your sacrifices and your family for your sacrifices as well. I wanted to ask you uh, on that, well, not when we finished the email, I wanted to speak about Minister Jabril and the rebuilding of the nation. Um, oh, yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, when, when, when did you uh, come into contact with him? And what was your uh, interaction with him? Okay. Uh, you know, when uh, prior to uh, 1975, I guess this was around 66, 67, you know, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad used to speak on the radio. Okay. Had, every city had a radio, most of them anyway. Uh, we, ours was on WBNX, BNX, yeah. Uh, at 6.30, every Sunday, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad would speak. And he would say, this is Elijah Muhammad, the preacher of freedom, justice, and equality to the so-called American Negro. And uh, it, it was a half an hour. And after the uh, mosque meeting, we would go either, I was working in the Shabazz restaurant, so we would put it on. So all the believers would be in there, others, the ones that didn't go home, uh, they would come in and we would put it on. And then next thing I know, Bernard Kushmir was on that. He was one mm. of them, uh, mm. Elijah Muhammad. So that's when I really heard about him. And he would come on and he would speak. Um, uh, I don't know how long he was on, maybe six months or, but every Sunday we would listen. And that was mm -hmm. when I first acknowledged him as a, as a minister and as a member of the Nation of Islam. And he was like a school teacher. You know, he, the way he taught, it was almost like you were in a classroom. Mm. And then next thing, uh, I think uh, Secretary John Ali, the Nas National Secretary, yes, he, would come, he would speak. And then after that, uh, um, Dr. Minister Lani Shabazz, mm -hmm. who was the, uh, the principal or the minister of the Washington, D.C., uh, Moss number four. Yes, he, sir. He, he would come on. And then finally, uh, Minister Farrakhan became the uh, speaker. And he was on there until the, the program was no longer in existence. And he would come on every Sunday and he would speak for a half an hour. And the lecture was so profound, and we would all be glued to it. But that, that's when I first acknowledged Minister uh, uh, Jabril. But then after the, I met uh, Minister Farrakhan um, in 1978, late 70, I believe it was eight, late 78, uh, he told us, me and my brother in law, that he was rebuilding the nation. We spoke to him for almost 16 hours literally 16 hours, 12 hours sitting in a restaurant in the next few hours just walking up and down the streets of New York City. And he told us, he said, I want you to uh, get in touch with uh, Brother Bernard Kushmir because we are rebuilding the nation. And, uh, and if you don't get in touch with him, get in touch with Brother, uh, um, Brother Minister Burke, Burke Jordan at the mm -hmm. time. And my brother-in-law got in touch with Minister Jabril. I didn't, I got in touch with Brother, um, Brother Burke. And then we got opened up uh, the Harlem State Office Building Educational Lectures. And uh, Minister Jabril would come into the city when Minister Farrakhan would come in to look over the, he didn't have the study sessions, but I always got the feeling that he was orchestrating and like an architect, because like yes, 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 yes. he would tell us uh, certain things that needed to be done. And he would talk about 
uh, the minister's work and not, not in the full sense, but I guess they were like organizing that we were exactly. aware that we didn't even know there were other study groups, you know? Um, and then and finally we got uh, the final, the first final call came out in 1979. Uh, the ultimate challenge uh that was the uh the title ultimate challenge uh what the, and it had a subtitle uh to it uh i can't recall the subtitle i have those copies but anyway yes. i became the editor of the new york uh, uh final call uh, edition mm. you know? yeah yeah Crazy working with uh, uh, some of my old my articles are in some of the first Go ahead, go ahead, Minister Hunt. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but anyway, um, then he started with the study groups and he would, with the study guides, excuse me, and he would come in and tell us about the study guides, how we should conduct the study sessions. He said there should be one person, the study group coordinator, and no one should uh, talk over the next person. So what he was doing was that he was um, like guiding and orchestrating and like like a like an architect, and all of his uh, meetings that he came he came up to New York one time in Harlem, and he was like I said he was like a school teacher. You know we like the fiery ministers. You know when the study guide or the study session to introduce, I welcomed it. You know why? Because after I left Wallace Muhammad, I said never again would I just allow someone to tell me what to say, when to say, what to think. I need to study on my own. And when he introduced the study sessions and the study guides, that was right, as you would say, right up my alley, because that's what I wanted to do is study so I can get it right. So I wouldn't have to depend on someone else, but depend on what I've learned and understand. So he would come in and uh, he would always teach like a school teacher. And that that is something I always uh, admired about the way he taught. He was that kind of person. You know, and he would always travel with the minister. But I think I mentioned that uh, in the interview, uh, in the final call, uh, I would tell, I told Brother Brian, I said, he would like always be in the shadows, but you knew he was there. You mm -hmm. knew that he was playing a role in the guiding and, and structuring the rebuilding of the nation of Islam. Yes. Yes, sir, all praise to a lot. Now for those who want, uh, we are coming at a time and where the Most High Minister Farrakhan has done such a great work, but this is towards the, I guess, the second examination, and th there'll be a, a time where we won't physically see the minister, and we don't, you know, how how do you, what advice would you give to the new generation to not have a repeat of what happened in 1975? I think I mentioned this before. I think um, study is very important. Constant prayer, asking Allah to bless you with understanding. I remember the, uh, the minister would always end that radio broadcast. He would say, and may Allah bless you with the light of understanding. In all, you, in, all, in all of your getting, you should get understanding. How do you get understanding? You, you have constant prayer, asking Allah to bless you with the understanding. If you don't understand nothing something, ask questions, ask questions. See, in the nation of Islam prior to 75, we didn't have an opportunity to ask any questions. And if you did, sometimes they would look at you and say, brother, you in doubt or something, brother? You know, what's wrong with you? You're, you're turning hypocrite. Mm, mm, <laughs> but mm. there's nothing wrong with asking questions. The whole, the, the, the lessons are full of questions, you know? You know, why do we run Yaku and his made devil from the rural civilization? That's, That's a question. Right. That's a question. Have you not heard that your word is bond and your bond is life? That's a question. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. What is the square mileage of the planet Earth? That's a question. And in the Quran, you know, it, it, it teaches you what, what would make you know or understand what the uphill struggle is. That's, That's a right. question. That's it's right. To free a slave. Yes, sir. So there's questions. All throughout, so you have to ask questions if you don't understand, and don't make, don't uh, let people think that you uh, are in doubt of anything, you know, because the question has to be answered. And I heard uh, the minister told us one time I was at his house on 
uh, Damon Avenue. And he opened up for questions. And I started asking questions. He, and he told the brothers and sisters there, because this is when he was on going on, I think, his second world tour. And we mm. went there with Brother Kareem. He took us all out there to, to give him a, a, a send off. Because I think he was leaving the day after. And we all went to his house on Damon Avenue in Chicago and Cicero. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. He asked questions. He said, don't do to me what we did to the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. He said, one time at the table, we were all saying, yes, sir, dear Holy Apostle. That's right, dear Holy Apostle. And he said, the messenger banged on the table. He said, how do you know I'm right? Did you ask me any questions? Did you research it? So questions are very important for the brothers and sisters. There will be a time that the minister won't be here. There'll be a time, and I teach my children that there'll be a time I won't be here, you know? So constant prayer, question, study, study. Now, what is the difference between study and reading? When you study, you do research. You go over that word. You try to understand what that mean, word means. What's the etymology of that word? Yes, you know, what's the breakdown of that word? What, what does it mean now as opposed to before? Because when you, when you have words, words like, like the word, like this is why we have to understand language because this is why we have to also learn how to speak more than one language. Because in Spanish, you say the word agua. You think that means water. That doesn't mean water. Doquera agua. It means give me, quench my thirst. So mm. the word represents the nature of the word itself, mm. what it means, what it does. You know, like if you, like a, like a, uh, like a hat, like it said, uh, sombrero. A sombrero means sun blocker. It blocks the sun. It doesn't mean hat. You understand? Mm. So the, 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 uh, the instrument or the thing represents the nature of the thing. This is why when uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, it says in the message of the black man, uh, the, the coming of God, the coming of God and the gathering of his people. He said, he asked Master Rama, he said, what is your name? He said, my name is Mahdi. Mm -hmm. He said, no, what is your real name? He said, my name is Mahdi. And mm -hmm. Honorable Elijah Muhammad asked him again, what is your name? He said, I'm my name is Mahdi. What he was telling him, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad wanted to know his personal name because mm. he used different names. But Master Farah Muhammad was telling him the nature and the, the his attribute and what he his job that he was to do. And the job of the Mahdi is to bring all truth and to crush the wicked. Well, he was well, telling well. him his attribute or his characteristics. So this is why we have to you know, understand language or the etymology of things. And you study and not just read, you know. So yes, and when when and 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 whenever he leaves, you know, all the believers should stay together. Stay because the, the enemy, once the enemy that he'll start introducing division. That's his nature. That's his nature to cause division and fractionalism among the believers. And uh you question everything that comes to you with with question with a good heart not with negative or contempt. Yes. And we, had to go, we had to go through that when the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was a terrible period. You know, uh, I was home for many, many days in, in, in confusion, in sadness, and my children said, Daddy, what's wrong? I had missed, I had, uh, uh, missed my leader. And this is why when I got, when I heard the minister, I said, oh, I said, is she know his voice. That's right. So I was home and then I saw a brother, he uh, on, on in my neighborhood, he said, um, he said, you look like a Muslim. He said, I was in the nation. He said, but I left when that whole controversy happened with Malcolm. He said, I'm a photographer. He said, I go around, I, I go to banquets and weddings. He said, I'm a member of a lodge, a Masonic lodge. He said, you're a young man. At the time, I think I was like, what, seven, I was like 25 years old. He said, you look very, uh, handsome and you, 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 you seem to carry yourself, you're well-spoken. He said, won't you come and join the lodge? He said, you can make so much money. He said, I'll teach you photography because he did the photography where you get the, the, the picture right, right then and there. And yes, sir, yes, sir. A little, yeah, and a little holder. And he said, he said, won't you join the, 
the, the lodge with me. He said, you'll make a lot of money. He said, there's a lot of women there too. I said, oh man, I said, and soon as he, I, I had contemplated because I wasn't doing anything. And I was at a time when I was kind of sad because our leader weren't there, you know? And, and as soon as I considered that, I heard the voice of the Honorable Louis Farrakhan mm. saying that he was having a meeting in New Jersey. Yep. Yes. Yeah. Good, Mr. Hot and Beautiful. Okay. I wanted to, and thank you everyone who continues to watch, like, share, subscribe to People's Podcast. What has been the greatest trial in your life and how have you overcome that trial? Um, I think with uh, my children, because they didn't know anything about, you know, the struggle that I went to, went through, uh, trying to stay afloat in a time where there was uncertainty. And they saw me at a point where I was in, you know, I, I was, well, they, they, the community I grew up in, I'm still in the same community where I was a young boy. So they never saw me, as they say, out of pocket. They, you know, I never, you know, went back to the grave with drinking or shooting drugs or snorting coke. Uh, I was just, just sad, not doing anything. I was uh, inactive, so to speak. And I wanted to make sure my children, and many of them had struggles, and I couldn't, like, help them where I, they, I was able to transcend or make a transition, but they had struggles with that. They had to go to school where the Christians were there. They had been Muslims all their life and uh, they had to deal with being, uh, wearing you know, the Muslim clothing and being laughed at. So that, that was a, a, a really a, a bad struggle for me because I wanted to make them uh, comfortable where they didn't feel, some of them, kind, they kind of felt ashamed because all the other children had Christmas and yes, Easter, yes, and yes, they sir. didn't have those things. You smiling, Brother Joshua, so you understand. Oh, I absolutely <laughs> understand. I absolutely understand. <laughs> yeah, and when they had to go on trips, they couldn't go to parties. They couldn't go out, and and it kind of hurt me because I didn't, I didn't have the, and we were rebuilding, so I didn't have those kind of alternatives for them, you know. And my daughter asked me one time. She said, "Daddy, you was in the nation." From 1965 to the 1975, now you with the Honorable Louis Farrakhan. He said, what did you get out of this? You don't have any more money. And they just didn't understand that I came to the nation because I believed in Allah and his messenger. And I believed in the idea and the concept and the vision of the nation of Islam. And But they saw it from a different perspective. They, saw that they felt that I should have had all of these great gifts and things, but I was, my gift was the fact that I was alive and conscious, you know, and all the guys, all the brothers that I grew up with in the streets, they, most of them were dead or went to jail, died from AIDS or, you know, or were, were dead. Yeah. So that was, that was my challenge and struggle. And yes, so, sir. And what has been the greatest joy in your life, sir? Oh, um, when I met, uh, you know, I always had the Honorable Elijah Muhammad in my heart. And, uh, you know, there was a point where we came to an FOI class. And at the time, the minister wasn't no, was no longer the minister of Mosque Number 7. It was Minister Ali Rashid, who had been a captain out of, um, out of California in mm. uh, 27. He became the minister. He was Captain Edward. He was the one that put me on post when I first came to save his day. But anyway, mm -hmm. uh, he called the general FY meeting and said that there is no more FOI. He said, you can, uh, uh, and one brother raised his hand and said, do I keep the uniform? He said, brother, stop being so emotional. No more uniform, nothing. He said, you understand what I said? No more FOI, which was like, I felt the, uh, like a knife went to my heart. Um, and he said, we no longer use the lessons and throw away the message of the black. We don't need those books. Brothers were literally throwing them things away. I always kept mine. So I had that kind of root uh, uh, in my heart for the, for, the, for the teachings. So when I heard the minister, you know, it kind of brought me to life again. 
And when I was able to sit down with him and for the first time since my teenage years in the young adult class with him, I was able to sit down and he kind of point by point explained to me what all had happened prior to 1975. I mean, I, I remember he told me that, uh, that he, you know, that he had went astray. And I said, no, dear brother minister. He said, no, so don't tell me that. He said, I know what I did. He talked about the messenger, how he wanted Wallace at one time to be, to help him to be a, a instrument in the nation. He said the messenger used to cry when he would hear that Wallace would say things. And he said, but he can't be in my house and in the nation when he doesn't love and respect the man that gave me life, God in person. So that was one of the joyous times. Uh, it kind of rejuvenated me. And uh, I remember uh, some of the brothers on the street that knew me prior to 75, they were you know, guys that I grew up with and they said they saw the difference. So when they saw me come back to life, they said, this is the uh, brother I remember. And, uh, and then uh, I was asked to help, you know, help rebuild in, in New York City, become the captain and then help with the ministry and, you know, um, help work with brother, uh, brother Kareem up and down the East Coast, everywhere the minister with the brother Kareem would call me. Sometimes he wasn't able to go. He said, brother Hawk, I want you to go. I can't be there. I'm going to Philadelphia or I'm going to DC. I want you to meet the minister at the airport in Rochester, New York. I want you to meet him in, uh, in, in Connecticut. You know, we would meet him and, you know, we went upstate and different places uh, I had a chance to travel. Those were the joyous times for me because I came to life again, you know, praise be to Allah, you know. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. well, I wanted to ask you, you speak a lot about your children, but let's talk about your wife, Sister Helen. Uh, <laughs> shout out to Sister Helen, yes, sir. Um, yeah. How important has she been uh, to you and your development and, and just as, you know, as a wife? A, a, a anchor, a support. You know, my wife never doubted me at all and always encouraged me. You know, like I said, she heard the teachings before me, uh, but she didn't She didn't uh, register at the time. You know, like I said, sisters, they, they have a little more intuition. They said, we're gonna wait and see what happens. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. They, they, they do things more more a little scientifically, yes, you know, but uh, from the time I came in, you know, I knew my wife when she was 14 years old and I was 15. That's how long I've known her. Mm -hmm. And uh, she came from a large family. She had, she had 12 um, brothers and sisters, you know, not, I think eight, eight, nine, 10, 11, seven, eight, nine, 10. She had about six, no, eight brothers. You know, these were tough guys. I was scared of them. Yes, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, she would always support me and um, encourage me. And when, when I was struggling to uh, come back in the nation uh, to rebuild, uh, she had some, she, she wanted me to be home, but she said, but if this is, if this is what you want to do and you believe in what you're doing and the teachings of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, she said, you go ahead. And then when she came in, she was, uh, she, like I said, she out muslim me and did charity and she would make all the uniforms. She was very skilled. She, all the sisters that wore uniforms in New Jersey and Connecticut and Philadelphia, it, it was my wife. Go yes, ahead, go ahead. yes, sir. She was a seamstress. She could cook because she used to cook for all our brothers and sisters, you know? And um, that's what made me stay so fit, you know? I had always had home cooked meals. Um, she was very um, uh, creative. She wrote two books. There's another book that we're going to redo called Mind Expanding and Revolutionary Poetry. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, she, uh, she worked very close, very close uh, in New York City with the sisters and developing all kinds of cultural programs and creative uh, events, a lot of the dinners and she was very, very uh, uh, involved in that. Uh, we had different cultural, uh, we went to plays, you know, and she, she was like an alternative to what a lot of sisters, because she didn't want to see them go back into the streets. And they would always consult with her, you know, many of the sisters to help them with their marriage and help them with their families and their daughters. And, you know, 
Yeah. Yeah. She's she's still, yes, we're sir. still together. Yes, All sir. Into a lot. What advice would you give to future fathers? Um, take some time with your children. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that the minister told me when we met with him, he said, those are one, those, th that is one of his regrets, that he didn't spend quality time with his children. And I remember we would, uh, he lived up in uh, an area in, in, in New York City called New Rochelle. It's uh, like in an area where a lot of black people own homes. And we used to go up there because we would do what is called overnight uh, security. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. still do that at the palace, right? Yes, sir. Overnight. And uh, we would go up there and I noticed that uh, there were old baseball bats in the yard. The fence was kind of sagging. And what that told me that a father wasn't there, mm -hmm. you know, uh, he didn't, he was traveling. You know, he was uh, he was a national representative of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, and he told me, and he has expressed it publicly, publicly that was one of his regrets that he didn't have enough time to spend with his sons and children. And I would encourage brothers; it, it doesn't have to be every day; it, it could be once a week. Just just go wherever they like to go and talk to them. And you know, I didn't have that opportunity; I didn't have a father like that. So the brothers in the nation were my big brothers and my fathers. So that's very important to young people, you know, and uh, I encourage that. And, and don't be judgmental against your wives because they know things that, you know, you may not see, you know, uh, be, a, be a man, be, be fair in your home. You know, I used to sit my children down and we would have like a, a, a discussion night and I would let, let, each one of them expressed what they felt. And they would say, Daddy, I don't like what you did. I don't like that you let Karima do this. Here. I don't like you let, I have a son named Gaddafi. You let Gaddafi. So, you know, do that with them. Sit, sit your children down and let them express themselves. See, in a black community, the worst thing you could do is tell children you can be seen and not heard. Very, very mm. counterproductive. Mm. Never do that. Children should be way, uh, wor uh, to express themselves. And this is why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad say, said in one of his last speeches, he said, once you come into the divine knowledge of God and truth, he said, you will come face to face with God. That's one of his mm -hmm. last interviews. Mm -hmm. Now, brothers and sisters might say, well, face to face, Master Farah Muhammad is gonna come knock on the door. Or oh, who's, who's, who's that face to face? Mm -hmm. That's some homework. That's your homework. You got homework, mm. brothers and sisters, mm, mm. and see what he meant, that you will come face to face with God himself. Yes, sir. Yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir, Mr. Hyde. Okay, now I want to add, Mr. Aisha says, it's, it's important to take time with your children. Thank you very much. Um, she takes time with her. Uh, her grandchildren spends a lot of time with them and her children, right. her grandchildren. Um, I wanted to ask you about your favorite movie. What's your favorite movie, sir? Um, well, I have about three. One okay, them, what's your three? What's your three? Let's go with it. Uh, uh, one of them is a, a movie called Excalibur. I okay. That. No, sir, I never seen it. It's about the Knights of the Round Table. Okay, know? okay. Yeah, uh, and all the knights were together, and 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 they worked together. They they struggled together. They fought together. It's like the unity. I related that to, um, to the um to the FOI. Yes, sir. And, yes, sir. And, and, and the King Arthur said, you must feed the men. The men must eat. The men must have uh, a lodging and clothing, you know. So when you're, when you're an army, the men has to be the men have to be fed. Their families have to be taken care of. That's right. So that movie, uh, there's another doc documentary called The Battle of Algiers. Mm, mm. The Battle of Algiers. And the first time I saw that movie, uh, was uh, a night with the FOI. We used to have what is called a night with the FOI. And we would sponsor certain uh, move, um, you know, events. And we, had, we showed that documentary. It was a battle of how the Muslims in Algeria ran the French out and the revolution came about in Algeria. This is 1954, 55. They, they actually had real footage and the, the second time I said, I went to a movie and the, in this movie I was sitting in, I was maybe it was two other black people. 
that there was doctors in there, there were lawyers in there, there were uh, district attorneys, there were uh, school teachers sitting watching this movie called The Battle of Algiers in the mm. night of the FOI when we sponsored that. Minister Farrakhan was there. I, I would think I was sitting in the row behind him. Captain Shaw was there. Uh, Captain John from out of Newark. The, the place was packed and, and it was about the Battle of Algiers and how the Algerian Revolution was won against the French. Mm. Algeria is in North Africa, if you don't know, you know. And uh, what is the other movie? There's one more. Uh, hmm. I'm trying to think of the next movie. Um, hmm. Oh, this uh, the movie that Brother um, Minister Ishmael talked about, The Day the Earth Stood Still. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Love that movie. Great movie. It has so Great much movie. science in it. I love science. The messenger said that he is a scientist. He said, right. what, he said, scientist. I like the way you used to say it, a scientist. <laughs> yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. I love, I love science. Yes, sir. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. And we have yes, one sir. more question. We have one more question for you, Minister Hack. And once again, on behalf of myself, my family, and the viewing audience of the People's Podcast, we thank a lot for you and your sacrifices and the many sacrifices of your family as well. Um, one of your daughters wrote, on your interview on YouTube, she said, that's my daddy, you know, like in the comments. So, so shout out to her as well. And, and your son, could <laughs> be, and all, everybody, you know, um, your yeah. family. And uh, we're inspired by you. And, and may Allah continue to listen in positive energy to you. And we look forward to getting that book. When you yes, get sir. the book, Minister Hot, can we get the exclusive interview when you release it? Can we get the first yes, one? Sir. Please, yeah. we want to get the, we yes, get the first got that, interview. Got that. Yes, I'm going to I'm, I'm put that down. <laughs> yes, sir. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Beautiful. I wanted to say, you know, both of my sisters are in the nation. You know, mm. Sister Sharon, who's married to Brother Arif. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. General Council. Yes, sir. Stephanie, who's married to the brother that organized the Junior FOI in New York City, uh, Brother Andrew Malik Muhammad. She's upstate New York in Albany. Yes, they've been in, they went to the University of Islam since little girls. Very, very important. They helped us with the rebuilding, and uh, we'll introduce them one day. Yes. Please, I, I will, it would be an honor to, to meet your uh, sister, sir, and ha have us meet your family. Uh, yes, your sir. parents, may, may I have your parents' name? My mother, my father's name was Abraham uh, Stewart. That was his slave name. He came from yes, uh, uh, Camden, South Carolina. He was a Geechee. You know what a Geechee okay. is? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, we used to eat fish and rice for breakfast, brother. I said, Daddy, where's the cornflakes? So every one of my friends eating cornflakes and Cheerio, we eating fish and rice for breakfast. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> but that's what we ate. And uh, my mother was uh, from uh, uh, Plymouth, uh, North Carolina, which is right outside of Raleigh. Mm -hmm. uh, and they came. Uh, they were both. Uh, my mother picked cotton until she was about 14. And my father about to say he picked tobacco. And they said, we are out of here. They came to New York because they hated the treatment that they experienced in those Southern uh, cities and towns, you know? And she watched her, my great-grandfather, uh, Alfonso, his name was Alfonso Brooks. He, his father was a white man and raped his mother and he couldn't even play with, he, he knew his white brothers uh, and sisters, but he couldn't play with them. And uh, he married my great-grandmother, Mozella Brooks, my mother' name is Carrie Brooks. She was, you know, she was a twin. There's twins in my family. Uh, my brother, my, my my mother was a twin. Her mother was a twin. My sister Sharon, that's in the next, She has two twin sons. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, my brother, he's a twin. Uh, he had about three sets of twins. Mm -hmm. They never the blood. It never ran through my DNA. I'm glad because I couldn't afford all that. I had, I had seven children already. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, they came from they came to Harlem, and uh, my father fought in World War II. My mother did domestic work, scrubbed floors for white people on her knees to feed us. And uh, they were told if you come to Harlem, there were streets paid with gold. There's money on the streets, mm. but that wasn't true. That was just to attract them. But they were they were good people, you know. Just you know. 
where they, they never finished high school or anything, but they had a love and a, a, a diligence to, to keep us together. And um, I'm glad they came to New York because I probably wouldn't be in the nation, you know. Yes, sir. Beautiful. Yes, sir. Well, we honor your parents and your bloodline and your family. And uh, people showing you love all around the world. I mean, it's hot. This is part two. Inshallah, we'll speak offline. So we, we got to make this a series because we have so much more that we could ask you. And yeah. I want to tell you one day about when Khaled came to New York. That was a roller coaster. Oh, well, no, we, we, let's go ahead and do that right now. Go ahead. We'll do that right now. Yeah, we can't do that right now. Okay, we can't do it. Okay. <laughs> okay, but that's, that's definitely noted. Yeah. That's <laughs> definitely noted for part three. Got yes, it. Sir. I think the, yes, sir. All right. Well, this is Joshua Leonard Muhammad signing off for the People's Podcast. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum salam. Thank you again, Brother Joshua. And give your family the greetings. And to all the believers, may Allah continue to bless each and, other, each and every one of us with goodness and care and all you do of good. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum salam, sir. Thank you all for watching. Yes, sir.